Today we visit an amazing private community tucked away in the Blue Ridge Mountains and tackle the challenging issue of dealing with deer pressure. You won't want to miss it, so stay tuned as we garden smart in Georgia. These moments of beauty and relaxation are brought to you by Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs, where every plant is performance tested, leaving you free to just enjoy. Find our award-winning shrubs at your local garden center. Bring the outdoors into your everyday life. Bass Pro Shops can outfit all your adventures, even those in your backyard. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here. DRAM has been providing gardeners with professional equipment for over 75 years. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. You have to rely on your gear, the way it feels, the way it does exactly what you need it to do. The F-Pace, how Jaguar makes an SUV. located in the North Georgia mountains approximately 60 miles from Atlanta. The community covers over 8,000 acres and features three lakes and two waterfalls. Nearly one-third of the property has been set aside as wildlife areas and parks. The property has more than 20 miles of trails with diverse wildlife and fresh mountain air. The first known people to inhabit Big Canoe were the Paleo Indians as many as 15,000 years ago. What is Big Canoe as we know it today was once referred to by Native Americans as the Enchanted Land. Something magical about this part of the North Georgia mountains has attracted people to it for centuries. Big Canoe as we know it today was originally the estate of Sam Tate, who found rich marble deposits on his land and bought as much of the surrounding land as he could. The land sat unused for some time until development started in the late 70s. Today, there are more than 3,000 residents who enjoy this beautiful slice of nature. There are many amazing gardens on the property, and one of the ongoing challenges these gardeners have is with a large population of deer that love to browse their plants. Today, we meet with Cynthia Hendry, who's a passionate gardener and a talented garden designer who has personally designed and installed hundreds of gardens in Big Canoe. She has over 30 years of experience working to solve the ongoing challenge of gardening with deer pressure, and today she shares her vast knowledge with us. Cynthia, thanks so much for joining us. Welcome to the show. Thank you for coming. Today we're going to talk about a topic that affects many of our gardening friends, and that's deer. We spend all this money and all this effort trying to recreate you know, a, our dream of what, of what heaven looks like in our yard, only to come out many mornings and find out that overnight, the deer have basically eaten every, all of our hard work, it's gone. And so it's, it's a big problem, you know, and especially for folks who are not you know, in urban centers. Uh, but even there, we see deer like, you know, in the middle of like crowded areas, they're, they're basically everywhere. I want you to give our viewers a sense of, of the scope of the problem that, that deer have become. The Great Depression, 1930, there were 300,000 deer because we were still eating deer, hunting deer a lot. I think now the number is some 33 million wow. around the country. They're everywhere. It's, it's a huge problem, not only for landscapes, but for uh, the forest as well as auto accidents. Uh, they eat three pounds of vegetation. 
wow. every day of their lives if they're healthy. And that's, a, that's an incredible number. We think about the impact that that must have on, on commercial agriculture as well, that uh -oh. you're going in and eating, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of, of, of profits there, but then they're also destroying very valuable plants that, that we put in our garden. And, um, and it's, it's something that is, of course, disheartening. Um, but then also there's, there's many problems that overpopulation have for the deer themselves. It's not a good thing for deer either. No, uh, they become unhealthy if they don't have enough vegetation to eat. The herd gets far too big for the forest. You have a biological capacity for any forest. And in uh, North Georgia, where we are, we enable them to survive with our landscapes. I think I told you at one point, we, uh, we lost five rhododendron bibiani, just twigs. Uh, one of the impacts that the deer have on the forest too is that when there's an overpopulation situation, they're overgrazing the forest. And so they're eating all the limbs off the trees as high as they can reach. And then all the new seedlings that are popping up that will become the next generation of forest or the next you know, succession of the forest, they're destroyed because the deer are eating all the little seedlings. Yeah, that was happening here at Big Canoe, uh, as well as our wildflower trail. We had the annual walks through our wildflower trail, especially in the early spring when all the spring furimals were coming up. And they were disappearing between our survey week and our actually tour week. People were coming from outside Big Canoe to see all the variety of species that we have. And the trillium and orchids and all were just slowly disappearing. But the as far as the forest itself, you don't have seedlings. Uh, they, they will browse all the seedlings uh, before summer is over, and so the forest can't regenerate. Yeah, this is this is all just the result of the natural predators, whether it was the red wolf from a long time ago, yeah. um, or you know humans yeah. eating deer. Um, those checks and balances really are not in place, and so what we end up having to do now, as as communities and as gardeners, um, is think about ways of of managing these populations you know, or even controlling where deer can travel. What are some ways that, that, that you can think of that would be effective from a standpoint of controlling deer populations? We have fencing allowed in Big Canoe, but it has to be very inconspicuous. We bray, we have scarecrows, spray water uh, in random places. We have rubber coyotes that you can put coyote urine on. When we did our deer study, uh, almost 20 years ago. We studied the problem for over a year because we we're a wildlife sanctuary. And it was not an easy problem for us to, to explore because we, we felt like it, this is a sanctuary for deer as well. But the study indicated that we had to protect the environment for all wildlife and the deer were destroying it. They're a keystone predator. They can destroy the forest for birds, for small animals, for everything, because they just eliminate herbaceous plants, shrubs, and, and trees up to five feet. So it becomes almost a sterile forest for everybody but them, and then they, just, they destroy themselves. They peak out at a certain population, and then they become really unhealthy. So in the study that you were involved in, and this was a pretty extensive study, you were looking at tracking the populations and then you know, understanding, okay, this is how many deer you know, we estimate we have, and then this number of deer would be a healthy population, and, and then you were harvesting or, or culling a, a chunk of the herd um, to maintain those populations in a healthy right. way. Big Canoe is 8,000 acres. Different neighborhoods had different problems. Uh, different levels. Um, the older neighborhoods where the, the homes had been there for a long time had a greater problem mm -hmm. than the others. So we had to look at each neighborhood. The wildlife biologists would come and survey the forest around the, the particular neighborhoods and determine that we needed to take so many out in this neighborhood, so many out in this neighborhood. I'm sure that when you were doing the study that, that you also looked at, at many different options as, as to you know, how, can we, how can we manage this population. Um, what were some of the other options that you looked at before you settled on culling? Um, biological control through birth control, 
But that's not a good option for us, uh, or for anyone for that matter. Uh, it's too unpredictable, it's very expensive. It would be probably a couple hundred thousand dollars oh, wow. for us to do for this large community. Everybody thought we could move them to South Georgia. <laughs> Nobody wants the deer. Everybody has a problem, especially the farmers. Uh, so there was no way we could we could eliminate the deer other than through a deer management program of knowing what the population is for each community, each neighborhood in Big Canoe, getting it down to a level that would allow the forest to regenerate and then to uh, do that annually and track it. Yeah, so this has been a very ambitious program and it's taken a lot of effort over many, many years. But you're seeing some really impressive results, aren't you? Yes, we do a, an autopsy study of the deer that we take out. The wildlife biologists come and actually assess the health of our herd and how, um, how many fawns they may have in their future. And that gives us predictions on how many we should take out the following year. Yeah, so the deer are happier and healthier. Yep. Also, there's there are fewer garden plants that are being eaten. Um, the disease is down, uh, malnutrition is down, and so it looks like nothing but upside. We have trophy deer. <laughs> trophy deer. <laughs> Outstanding. Well, it's a great program. It's also something that I think that, that communities ought to look at. You know, that it, it's, it's not a problem that's going to fix itself, of course. No. You, uh, you will end up having a forest with very few species of plant material, and that's not a healthy forest. Cynthia, I've had so much fun this morning walking through your garden. It, it's so thoughtfully well planned out, and it's such a beautiful place. I'd like for you to give our viewers a walking tour of it, if you would. We garden on about five acres. I have probably three acres of fence so to keep the deer out. It's an old forest. It's probably a 60, 70 year old forest. Mature oak trees, high overstory. Sunlight is a limiting factor. I try to use as many native plants as I can. Many native uh, shrubs are deer resistant. Some are not. It's trial and error over the years. I've gardened here for over 30 years so Trial and error has been a major piece of putting this garden together. I use a lot of very natural formed plants. Big Canoe does not like formality. Uh, we put boxwood on our list recently because boxwood is deer resistant, but we indicated that nobody could prune it into a Georgia bulldog. <laughs> Clever. Sunlight as I said, it's a limiting factor. So we prune the trees up a little bit so that we get a little east sun and a little west sun to the landscape. One of the things I really do like about your garden is that natural feeling. It feels like we're walking through just a, a beautiful woodland. And, and I think that that's what makes it fit with this site really, really well. Also, one thing I think that's worth mentioning is that there's, there's quite an elevation change from the bottom of the driveway to the top of your property. And um, how's that from the standpoint of gardening? Prune your way to the top. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's tough. That is a limiting factor too for a mature gardener like me. It does give a lot of interest to the plant display, as you'll see. You can elevate plants and right. layer plants up the side of the mountain and really create some drama. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very nice canvas. And of course, you've got these beautiful little trails that, that allow for little garden rooms and, and kind of, you know, more hidden private areas. I have two miles of trail. And I try to plant the edge of the trails with native wildflowers. Well, it's very, very beautiful. You've designed hundreds of gardens, and many of them are right here in Big Canoe, where there is, of course, significant deer pressure. And I'd like for us to talk a little bit about, from a design standpoint, what are the considerations that go through your mind when you're looking at a site where you know deer are gonna be an issue, and trying to plan the garden around that to give that garden the best shot at surviving the onslaught of deer? First, I'm, I need to know the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Is it one of the neighborhoods that has more deer pressure? Generally here, our older neighborhoods have more deer pressure. Then you need to identify 
the safest places in the garden and the most vulnerable places in the garden. You want to put your more deer resistant plants out on the fringes where the deer will feel real safe by, because they can jump back into the woodland. Fuzzy leaves, they don't like. Any plant with a scent, like your herbs, are more resistant. A lot of the plants have a fragrance. If you crush the leaf on it and it has a fragrance, they generally don't like that. It has some uh, chemical in it that, that's a little toxic to them probably. I've noticed with many of the plants, like right behind you, we've got hydrangea paniculata, which deer do like to eat. Yes. Um, but I noticed that your, your strategy there is, is allowing these plants to get really tall so they're out of the range uh, where the deer can browse. They could jump up on this, this plant, but generally I have um, other plants around it that are resistant. It confuses their nose a little bit to have other uh, resistance plants around your plants that are more vulnerable. You have many boulders spread throughout the garden, and, and this is something that you and I were talking about earlier as we, as we were strolling through the garden. And uh, you had mentioned that a strategically placed stone is also a good form of deer control. It's a cheap addition to your garden in terms of maintenance. Uh, you don't have to fertilize it. You don't have to spray it. It looks beautiful. It grows lichens. So really, we're, we're looking at, at the right plant in the right place, looking at plants that, you know, that categorically deer don't like to eat. And, in, and if we want to go with some plants that deer do like, let's say we want to plant some hostas, which we know they love. Have a small part of your garden fenced, and you can do that with something attractive, and then put the um, wire inside that, and usually make a safe place. A lot of uh, homes in Big Canoe have one corner of their garden slightly fenced, and that gives them a place that they can have their favorite grandmother's rose. Or well, that's great advice, Cynthia. Thank you. So we spent some time talking about garden design principles that, that improve our probability of success if we have deer pressure as an issue. And uh, you gave us a number of great tips there. I want to talk about some specific plants inside of some of these categories that we talked about, like plants with fuzzy leaves. And we could use something like Stachys lanata that the deer don't really like to eat. What are some of the plants, say, in the category of toxic plants um, that our viewers could find at garden centers? At the ground level, I use um, geranium bacova. It seems to have a toxic leaf. I have trialed it at the uh, edge of my garden, and I've never had it browse at all. Ferns are not vulnerable, except early spring. They eat the fiddlehead, so if you see a grouping of ferns where they've been clipped off, it looks like you did a weed eater on them, that can be a deterrent for some people. All of the cephalotaxis, and I love cephalotaxis because it comes in every form. The one that uh, looks like a Christmas tree, the pastrata that will be like a ground cover. Combine that with the bowl leaves of hellebores and you got a great combination. A deer resistant garden at Big Canoe begins in spring with daffodils and hellebores. But I'd like to encourage gardeners to consider later blooming deer resistant bulbs. Check your bulb catalogs. There are tons of bulbs that bloom all the way through spring and summer that are very deer resistant. If you consider lilies and dahlias, you can go into fall. Let's talk about some of the larger shrubs and, and even trees. You know, of course, there's um, any of the big woodland trees are going to be a great idea because they're they're out of the range of where deer can eat them. Um, but let's talk about some of the some of the, the mid to large size shrubs that, that work well in a in a deer populated area. For large evergreens, we use the American holly, Ilex opaca, Agarista poplifolia, and the various anise species, um, Elysium parviflorum and Elysium floridatum. For mid-sized evergreens, I like the smaller forms of the Osmanthus. I love Pierce Japonica, mountain fire with its new red growth. Right, in right. The Variegata with its orange and it's growth stunning. in spring. Ah, gorgeous. If you have time for them to grow large, the native mountain laurel selections can be a bonus when they bloom. Oh, 
for me, they are slow growers, usually not browsed, unless there's a really bad winter and no acorns. If your deer pressure is great, steer clear of rhododendron and azaleas. Some of the other ones that come to mind too, I think of, are viburnums generally as a, as a category. And especially as they get taller and then they get out of the range of browsing. When they're young, they, they will be browsed from time to time. Also the bottle brush buckeye um, is another plant that deer typically don't like to eat. Exactly. Cynthia, I love having large hardwood trees for, for shade. And, and even in like a, a moderate sized garden, there's no substitute for some of these wonderful noble trees. When they're young, however, deer will eat them and it doesn't matter what it is. And so we, we've got to protect them in those early years. What advice would you have for our viewers? Um, they're vulnerable by the bucks. They can totally destroy it. So if you're planting a smaller tree, we put a tomato cage around oh. it uh, for a period of time until it gets tougher. That protects it. I've planted seven Japanese maples in the forest and I have to have a fence around them, a tomato cage. But I tell people that if you want a low maintenance, deer resistant garden, plant trees, big trees, mm -hmm. that will ultimately be big trees, and ferns, that's a low maintenance combination. Well, Cynthia, we've had so much fun walking through your garden today, and we've learned so much from you. This is a beautiful place, and I suppose deer are gonna be with us forever. And so it'll be an ongoing concern, something that we have to think about as gardeners. And I feel like you've given us some great tips and ideas that, that we can take to our own gardens um, to try to deer-proof them to the best of our abilities. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I'm glad to share. Each week we travel the country, north to south, east to west, visiting some of the most exciting gardens, as well as talking to industry horticulturalists about design principles, new plants, and also how you can be most successful with your home gardens. We also love answering your gardening questions, so visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. These moments of beauty and relaxation are brought to you by Proven Winners Flowering Shrubs, where every plant is performance tested, leaving you free to just enjoy. Find our award-winning shrubs at your local garden center. Bring the outdoors into your everyday life. Bass Pro Shops can outfit all your adventures, even those in your backyard. Bass Pro Shops, your adventure starts here. DRAM has been providing gardeners with professional equipment for over 75 years. DRAM products feature nine water patterns and are designed to nurture your plants with a shower of rain. DRAM for lawn and garden, available at garden centers near you. You have to rely on your gear, the way it feels, the way it does exactly what you need it to do. The F-Pace, how Jaguar makes an SUV. Managing deer in the garden is an ongoing and important task if we're going to have success growing our favorite plants where deer like to browse. Today we visited a beautiful garden and picked up some great tips on things we can do to successfully garden where deer abound. If you have questions about anything you've seen today, visit us on the web at Gardensmart.com. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram. And remember, even if you're a master gardener, there's always more to learn. So join us next week for more great garden tips and ideas as we Garden Smart.